All right, great. So I'm going to introduce you as Dr. Ben Beard, the <laughs> Deputy Director of the Division of Vector-Borne Diseases at the Centers for Disease Control. So I, I have a question that I think one thing people might be interested in is, because there are so many government agencies involved in this, like, can you sort of, in, in simple lay terms, tell people the difference between, or the difference in the mission between like a CDC and the NIH in terms of vector-borne diseases or others? Yeah, so um, CDC, we, we work closely with, um, a, with uh, NIH. As you know, we're, we're considered operator, operation, <laughs> operational divisions, or opdivs as we call them, of, uh, of HHS, the uh, Department of Health and Human Services. And so that's CDC, NIH, FDA, CMS, um, um, you know, uh, there's a couple of other operating divisions as well, HHS proper. So if you're familiar with the Tick-Borne Disease Federal Advisory Committee, which I know you're familiar with, that's actually run out of HHS. Uh, but so they're, um, and they're leading the charge in the vector-borne disease national strategy efforts that are, that are uh, just beginning. And so um, what our division of labor is, uh, we really work in public health. So we conduct um, uh, surveillance for the d reportable diseases. We're in charge of uh, national diagnostic and reference activities. We work closely with the state health departments and uh, somewhat with local health departments as well, but mostly with state health departments on uh, diagnostics and reference testing and surveillance as well. And we do some amount of operational research, really prevention oriented research. Um, so, and, and the distinction I, may, I would make with NIH is that they also are very interested and involved in diagnostics um, and in prevention and things like that. But their work is more in a um, little bit more basic research uh, whereas ours is really more public health oriented uh, mm -hmm. and a bit more, typically a bit more applied. But, you know, there's overlap there, both in diagnostics and in prevention tools. Uh, we do some vaccine work, even though um, mostly uh, that, that fits more under NIH than under us. So we complement each other uh, and work together very, very closely, but we do a little bit different emphasis, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah, sure. Some of the people that will be watching this are, are students, and I know that many of the students that I interact with, CDC is the dream job for them. So do you have um, just general guidance on how people get there or what jobs are available for folks? And yeah, I would, um, um, in, in terms of jobs at CDC, I, you know, I can, I can tell you actually a little bit about my own background because sure. that would sort of feed into that naturally. But um, I've been at CDC for 29 years. I came to CDC in 1991, uh, fresh out of a uh, postdoc that I did at uh, Yale School of Medicine. And um, so um, before that, I, I did my uh, bachelor's in entomology at Auburn University in uh, Alabama. And I did my master's in medical parasitology at LSU Medical School in New Orleans, and then I did a PhD at uh, University of Florida, in, again in entomology. So my interest has always been in medical entomology, insect-borne diseases, um, and um, I had a job actually right out of high school with the Tennessee Valley Authority, TVA. Sure. And um, TVA, um, you know, built the dam systems throughout the South uh, for, um, you know, hydroelectric power and economic development of the rural South in the 40s. And uh, when they started backing up water uh, with dams, they created problems with mosquito breeding. Mm -hmm. And so a whole program uh, was created at um, TVA uh, focused on malaria. And uh, that program over the years uh, evolved to mosquito control and then ticks. And so I worked for five summers uh, at the Land Between the Lakes in Kentucky, uh, working out of uh, Muscle Shoals, Alabama, TVA, and we worked on, uh, on prevention and control of uh, 
uh, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever carried by uh, ticks. And so I sort of cut my teeth on uh, field tick work. That was in the, in the 70s, in 1976 was when I started working for them. And I'd always thought my dream job would be working in public health at the CDC because they were sort of uh, not too far away in Atlanta and I'd always heard about the work that they did there. And so I have to say I had aspirations of working at CDC going all the way back to uh, when I was uh, a graduating high school student and uh, got involved in medical entomology, decided to make those that degree my major and sort of uh, was really, um, you know, um, I worked under a guy named uh, Joe Cooney, who was the branch chief there at the time, and he was my Little League baseball coach and Church League basketball coach. And he got he inspired me in this field and got me started. And so he was very instrumental in uh, getting me jump started in the career that I had. And um, and then I was able to leave um, Yale School of Medicine and get a job working in public health at CDC, originally in malaria and, and uh, parasitic diseases. And then I came to Fort Collins in 2003 uh, to work with uh, Lyme disease and plague and tularemia and the, those things. So uh, really, I, I think just having a general interest in entomology, insect-borne diseases, public health, uh, that's how I ended up at CDC. So I don't want to digress, but I'm sure it'll come as a big surprise to a lot of people listening that Malaria was once endemic in North America or in the continental United States. And I'm sure a lot of people don't know that, but even as far, far north as Massachusetts. Yeah, for sure. Um, so the other thing I noticed in reading your biography is that you're an associate editor and you said you've been involved with uh, Emerging Infectious Diseases or EID, which is the, an organ, a, a publication organ from the Centers for Disease Control, which I, I think is a great, a great example of a top notch notch journal that's free um, for anybody that wants to. I remember as a graduate student in particular, I liked it because you could just fill out a card, a, a virtual card, and, and you could get uh, paper copies. I don't get the paper copies anymore. I, I just like the electronic copies, but it's a great journal and people here might be interested to know about its availability. Lots of stuff about ticks and tick-borne diseases and emerging zoonoses, et cetera. And it has, as we've talked about, some, some great cover art. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's really always had a very strong interest in zoonotic diseases. And um, it, we, one thing just to remember in terms of sending articles there, um, EID, uh, since there um, really reaches the, the world of public health, of uh, research um, in infectious diseases, disease ecology, the drivers of uh, disease outbreaks and things like that. And um, as a, an associate editor for the journal, one of the things we usually like to see in articles is really an emphasis on human disease. So a lot of times if it's a paper that's just purely entomological, uh, vector control, things like that, it usually articles, the EID would, on those topics will usually get sent to, uh, um, you know, more of an entomological specialty journal, unless it has a human disease component to it that's, that's very um, evident. And uh, that really has to do with more with the target readership. But that's one thing to keep in mind. But, but you know, it's a, it's a great journal, uh, one of the top infectious disease, uh, top rated infectious disease journals in the world and open access, free publication, uh, easily uh, um, uh, queried, you know, online. So it's a good place to publish. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Well, that's a great segue into the topic today, which is on the tick-borne diseases in the United States. So um, should we move over to the slides? Yeah, sounds good. Now what I'll be talking about today in the next few minutes is uh, tick-borne diseases in the United States and um, about burdens, trends, and drivers, or by drivers, I mean the uh, factors that um, really contribute to the emergence of tick-borne diseases. And so that's what you see here in the outline, uh, uh, burden and distribution, disease trends, uh, drivers, and then I'll end by talking a little bit about tick-borne disease prevention and control. So um, as many of you will know, um, between, um, and this is summary uh, summarized, um, this slide summarizing the article that we published in the MMWR in a, a volume called uh, Vital Signs. 
and it really was the state of vector-borne diseases in the United States. And um, we uh, were looking at a time frame from 2004 to 2017 in the original article, but this is expanded to 2018. But the interesting thing is that over this period of time, there were more than 760,000 cases of vector-borne diseases that um, were reported in the United States. And um, and I might as well talk a little bit about this right now, but when we say reported, certain diseases are considered nationally notifiable. And this is um, from a vote of the Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists or an organization we call CSTE. And so CSTE uh, has voting members from all the state and territorial uh, the departments of epidemiology um, around the country. And so these are state uh, health departments primarily and territorial health departments. They decide what diseases should be nationally notifiable. If it's a, a disease or condition is notifiable, then uh, what happens when a disease is reported, uh, when it's diagnosed by a local physician or healthcare provider, uh, there's a case report form that gets filled out that gets channeled to the city or county health department, to the state health department, Department, and then they report those to CDC each year. And so we track the disease trends over the years of these reportable diseases. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about underreporting in a few minutes, but uh, under, there are caveats to this, these reported data. But so the 760,000 that you see here is really reported vector-borne diseases in the U.S and uh, that occurred over that period of time. The uh, number of annual reported disease cases of mosquitoes, ticks, and flea-borne diseases actually doubled over this period of time, which is an alarming trend. Tick-borne diseases accounted for over 75% of all vector-borne diseases. Mosquito-borne disease epidemics, however, are happening more frequently, as you have noticed, noticed with outbreaks like Zika and chikungunya and dengue that we've had over the last few years. And then finally, the, as I mentioned, the reported data substantially underestimates the actual disease occurrence by anywhere from eight to 70 fold, depending on the disease. And so what happens, let's just take an example like Lyme disease. If you're a physician in Connecticut and it's in um, July uh, or June or July, and it's the 10th case of Lyme disease you've seen in a child that week in your clinic, you know, you're thinking, I'm busy, everyone knows that Lyme disease is here. Why should I take the time to fill out a case report form, send all this information in, who benefits from that? They're busy, we're busy, everyone's busy, so that just that case doesn't get reported. And we call that reporting fatigue. And that, co that commonly occurs in the high incident areas. Massachusetts is especially hard hit by that, um, other parts of the uh, Northeast. With diseases like West Nile virus, uh, as you probably know, if you have 100, 100 cases or 100 infections, only 20 of those will be clinical illnesses. 80% of those really are mild asymptomatic cases. They don't get diagnosed, they don't go to a doctor, they don't get reported. 20% of those are gonna be flu-like illness. Uh, they're gonna be serious enough that they go to a doctor, they get a test done, those cases get reported probably, depending on how sick the person is and whether they go in or not. And then about one to two patients out of 100 that get West Nile are going to be very serious patients, usually older uh, patients because they're more predisposed. And um, those may be fatal or near fatal encephalitis uh, cases, which always get reported. They get diagnosed and they get reported very commonly. So that's why 70 fold, that just indicates that, you know, 80% of the patients that get West Nile uh, get mild cases and they're not reported. So this is just something to keep in mind when we think of surveillance. And uh, we can talk about that later, but I don't want to spend too much more time on it. But, you know, as you probably know, also each year in the U.S., there are human fatalities that are caused by uh, tick-borne diseases. And these are primarily linked annually to cases of Rocky Mountain spotted fever, uh, Lyme disease carditis, which is a more severe form of Lyme disease, and then Poisson virus encephalitis, which I'm sure people in the Northeast are very familiar with, with both Lyme and Poisson, maybe less so with, with uh, Rocky Mountain spotted fever. 
This slide um, really shows the top 10 reportable or notifiable vector-borne diseases, six of which, as you see, are tick-borne diseases. So you can see Lyme disease, uh, spotted fever, rickettsiosis, anaplasma, babesiosis, ehrlichiosis, and tularemia here are all tick-borne infections. And that's why, as I mentioned before, uh, tick-borne diseases account for over 75% of all reported vector-borne disease cases. For those six uh, tick-borne diseases, this is the general distribution that we see around the country. And if you look at the maps on the top, you see Lyme disease, anaplasmosis, and babesiosis. They all share a very, um, very similar distribution. And uh, this is uh, linked to the fact that they're carried by the same tick species, Ixodes scapularis in the upper Midwest and the uh, Northeast, and Ixodes pacificus in the West Coast. And so then if you look at the lower set of maps, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, or actually this would be more correctly spotted fever rickettsioses, because there are a couple of different agents uh, in addition to rickettsia rickettsii that cross-react on the diagnostic test. And so we consider them all as spotted fever rickettsia now, um, but the most serious of those typically are Rocky Mountain spotted fever. And then there's ehrlichiosis and tularemia. These are carried by either Dermacenter variabilis, which is the American dog tick, or by Amblyoma americanum, the uh, lone star tick, in the case of, two, of uh, ehrlichiosis. And they have a, a distribution more across the central belt of the United States and then up the eastern seaboard where they are associated there in some cases with uh, Amblyoma americanum. Though um, Dermacenter variabilis is still considered the primary vector of Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Can I ask a question about the Lyme disease map, the upper left-hand one? Yeah, of course. So a number of people will notice that the distribution of those purple dots where there's Lyme disease is not perfectly correspondent with the distribution of the Ixodes scapularis ticks. What's the, what's the CDC's thinking on that? Yeah, um, very good question. And, and that really gets to the way um, diseases in general are reported in the United States. They, they're reported according to the residents of the, uh, of the case. So, um, so it's really the state of residence, the county of residence where the person uh, lives who contracts the disease. So if you live in, um, we'll say in Arizona and you uh, travel to uh, Massachusetts on vacation, you know, in June or July, and you're bitten by um, black-legged tick, you come back home, you develop um, an erythema migraines rash or arthritis or something like that, and you tell your healthcare provider, well, I was in Massachusetts recently, and I got bitten by this tick, and so you're diagnosed and treated. That case is actually reported in Arizona, not in Massachusetts. And so we see dots where Lyme disease is diagnosed and reported all over the country. Now, we, I'll talk about this in a little bit. Uh, we consider states high incident and low incident states. And these areas that you see that are all dotted out are clearly in the high incident states. But there are also low, lower incident states where we do have some degree of transmission uh, of Lyme disease. It may just not be common there uh, but because the ticks that carry it are not common or they don't commonly bite people. Um, you know, Ixodes scapularis, the black-legged tick, is also present in the south, but it doesn't feed as often on humans as it does in the northeast. It has a different biology, a different ecology, and different feeding uh, behavior in areas outside of the northeast. So there are fewer cases. In those cases, in, in these examples, those cases are locally acquired or, or may be locally acquired. But in other cases, it's also travel associated. Thank you. So moving on to the next slide, uh, this really just shows the top 10 states where Lyme disease cases are reported, and it's got them uh, ranked by incidence, and incidence is a little bit tricky sometimes. It's not the total number of cases. It's the cases per 100,000, so it's, uh, it's a measure of incidence of mine. And so as you see, um, Maine is the highest incidence um, uh, state for Lyme disease. It doesn't have the highest number of cases, uh, that would probably be Pennsylvania, if I remember correctly, or, and maybe New Jersey after that, but it is the highest incident state. And um, what you don't see here on this map 
is on, on this chart is Massachusetts. And I'll say a little bit, since I know that's where you guys are. And so I'll say a little bit about that in this map. This map really shows what we consider low and high incident states. And the high incident states, you can see are shaded in gray. And really just the point to make from this map, and this is one snapshot, one year, 2018. And um, if you look at Massachusetts, you can count the uh, dots there on uh, one or two hands. And that's just simply because in 2016, Massachusetts was so overwhelmed with the numbers of Lyme disease cases and spending so much time having to report those cases because case reporting is laborious. Uh, you have to have both a diagnostic test and a, ca a case report form. And so they felt like they could either spend all their time counting tens of thousands of cases or they could spend their time and money on efforts really aimed more at prevention. So they transitioned to a surveillance method that really relies more on laboratory reports. And since it didn't uh, match the de case definition of CSTE, those cases don't get reported to us. That's all that means. And so it is high incidence. There's lots of Lyme disease there. Uh, Massachusetts Department of Health has all the information on there, but they don't show up on this map. So uh, I just wanted to explain that. And, and again, the point you've already made, that these are, there are Lyme disease cases in many other parts of the country as well. Some are travel related, some reflect tick vectors that are a little bit less uh, voracious as, than the uh, black-legged tick. So I mentioned underreporting already, and I want to say a little bit about the burden of illness because, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, Lyme disease cases, only about a tenth of all the Lyme disease cases are actu actually reported. So this actually, this slide shows some of the studies we've done to better understand the burden of illness. And they go back to 1992, uh, surveys that were done in Maryland in 92, 93, uh, some model work, that modeling work that was done, chart reviews, and then two studies that we did in 2008 and 2010, one that looked at insurance databases uh, to look at what we call uh, at that time ICD-9 codes, which are the diagnostic codes. So that when you go to a doctor and or a healthcare provider and you have a tick bot, you have an illness, um, they uh, chart that so that insurance companies can um, they have a way of tracking the cost of uh, medical care. And so they give a diagnostic code. And so this code, by searching these huge, uh, di these huge um, insurance databases, we could actually determine how many ICD-9 codes for Lyme disease were there among these patients. And, um, and based on that, we learned that actually uh, somewhere between um, 280 and 360,000 cases of Lyme disease occur each year in the United States in terms of insurance claims. We also did another study looking at uh, diagnostic, test diagnostic testing companies from around the U.S., and we did a survey of these tests to see how many tests are run, how many positives they get, and interestingly, using totally different method, we got it converged on the same number, around 300,000 uh, cases of Lyme disease uh, diagno diagnosed each year in the U.S. So we know that these numbers are, are pretty robust, that we have, you know, for the 33,000 cases that are reported, we, we have, you know, over 300,000 cases that went underreported that, that still occurred. And these are clinical illnesses. They're not sub, uh, uh, asymptomatic cases. Uh, they're, they're true clinical illnesses for, for Lyme. And so uh, it's a huge, huge public health problem. And that's true for the other tick-borne diseases as well. They're, they're probably similarly underreported for Ehrlichia and anaplasma as well. So that's just something um, that we need to keep in the back of our mind about reporting and burden of illness. So to go a little bit broader than just Lyme and, and those more common tick-borne diseases, uh, there's several other viral tick-borne diseases, three of which are not reported at all. And so we don't get consistent reports from the states, though, because we do reference diagnostics for these. We typically get uh, consulted and end up doing the diagnostics at CDC for these. So th these include uh, reportable, being Powassan, the non-nationally notifiable, those are Colorado tick fever, Heartland, and Bourbon. 
And so we do see cases of these. Powassan can be a very serious illness. I know that um, in the Northeast, in the same places where you have Lyme disease and anaplasmosis and Babesia, you have Powassan emerging there as well. And so it's, a, it's an emerging public health problem, very serious illness. Um, and then in other parts of the country, we have uh, Colorado tick fever, especially here in the Rockies where we are, and then Heartland and Bourbon virus that are, are also um, tick-borne tick um, uh, viral pathogens. Um, we see, um, we've seen about two dozen individuals that were bitten by Powassan positive ticks. We've actually seen individuals bitten by viruses that uh, all the viruses represented here. And um, what we've done as a matter of course is we notified Katie Brown, who's our state epidemiologist when this Massachusetts case, and then more recently with the Heartland and Bourbon cases let uh, uh, Byron Backinson know. Is there any way that CDC would want to be notified of those kinds of exposures? Is it, is it of any interest or? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very interesting to us because we are very, they're not, uh, Powassan, of course, is reportable. And so we're going to, um, you know, if Katie or Brian or someone has a case, we're, we're going to, they're going to talk to us about it. We'll hear about it one way or the other. They're, they're also, both of them are really close collaborators of ours and, uh, and we really appreciate their expertise. And, and um, in terms of what you're seeing in ticks, um, you know, they made them, may, they, uh, there, there's no requirement for reporting, and so they may or may not tell us about it. If we're uh, talking at a meeting, they'll, they'll probably mention it if, it kind of, if the subject comes up. But yeah, that's of a, a real interest to us. Anything we can learn more about the potential, um, um, the, the potential distribution. And, and uh, you, you may know, um, we've started a national program for uh, tick surveillance. And so, um, and this is with the state health departments. So we're funding them to do, do this work. And so when they get a tick and they test it, uh, they can either send it to us for identification and testing, or they can test it themselves. And, um, and then we uh, can map, we're, we're mapping that information now, making that available. And the benefit of that is it helps us have a better idea um, of where the uh, area of potential risk is. Um, one, of the, one of the criticisms that we get about national surveillance is that if you live in one of these low incident states and uh, you're a patient, you come in with a tick bite, you know, there's a concern that if you go to your physician and say, well, I picked this tick up and now I have a fever and I'm not feeling so well, uh, they might say, well, you know, there's no Lyme disease here because it's not on the map, on CDC's map. And, um, and so uh, there's a possibility that they might run, not run the diagnostic test or the patient not, might not get diagnosed or might not get treated. And if that happens, then they might not get reported or they, they, they wouldn't get reported. And so their dot never does appear on the map. And so that's a criticism that we receive of national human disease surveillance. So one of the things we've done to try to address that is to, um, is to develop, is to um, expand the capacity for doing uh, tick testing around the country. And um, so that when we get a positive tick, we can actually map that. And um, so that that actually uh, is, is a tool for allowing uh, local health care to know a little bit more about the potential risks in, a, in an area, you know, in their state by uh, county level information. We don't use that data for uh, patient care, but we use that for um, for really for surveillance and reporting to better understand um, uh, the areas of risk that people live in. I know so, here in Massachusetts, there's been pressure on some of the uh, mosquito, con we have mosquito controlled districts uh, to pick up the burden of tick tick-borne surveillance, but there really isn't capacity for doing that here in Massachusetts. Do most states manage to find staffing and resources enough to enact a, a sur an active surveillance program? Yeah, the, you know, that's a good question. And I think the short answer to that is no. Uh, it's interesting, all over the country, uh, there are mosquito um, abatement districts, mosquito control districts uh, that are supported uh, usually by um, um, city or county uh, taxes uh, that, that pay for those services. And um, the, the irony, though, is that even though um, there 75% of all vector-borne diseases or, or tick-borne diseases, um, tick 
control falls on the, uh, is showed the responsibility for that is shouldered uh, by homeowners themselves, not by, generally not by communities. And um, it's just a tradition that's been out there. And, um, you know, mosquitoes are a huge pest and people are annoyed by them. And clearly it takes more than just a homeowner approach to control mosquitoes. And I think what people are slowly beginning to realize is that um, it's gonna take a similar approach to control ticks and tick-borne diseases as well. Uh, because the uh, deer that harbor the ticks and the um, small rodents that harbor the spirochetes uh, for Lyme and the virus, you know, Powassan virus or the, um, uh, the, or the other agents, whether it's um, anaplasma or, what, or Babesia, uh, these rodents move from yard to yard. They don't know, uh, they don't appreciate boundaries between cities and counties and neighborhoods. And so if you control your ticks in your property, but your kids are playing next door or uh, they're going to the local park, um, or you don't spray, you know, if you contract to be tick control, for tick control, they're not going to spray your vegetable garden, and they're not going to spray near um, water, water features around the yard. Uh, there are areas that are not going to get sprayed. So, uh, so the, it's very difficult to control ticks just on a homeowner-based um, uh, approach. But there are uh, contractors that are doing that now, and, um, but, um, and that's great. But um, currently, that falls on the back of backs of homeowners to do, not on communities. So we're we're very eager to uh, work with communities to begin to change the way people think about that. I think mosquito control districts are amenable to this to the conversation. They'd like to help, but they can't take on an unfunded mandate. Sure. And so that's where that's where the um, the debate is right now. So sort of transitioning into trends from burdens now going to trends, uh, this, this uh, graph really shows what we've seen um, over the last um, you know, 15 years or so um, about with uh, tick-borne diseases, the blue bars are Lyme disease and you know, the others are um, anaplasma and, and spotted fever rickettsia and whatever else. And then the uh, line that you see, the jagged line is all, all tick-borne disease cases. And so you, see, we, you can see that we've had this steady increase. Now what you uh, also see is that when you get into 2000, 15 and beyond, it kind of flattens. And that flattening and even goes down in 2018 is uh, really due to uh, the public health system being completely overwhelmed by disease surveillance. And so they're just doing all they can and, the, the, and it's just not being reported. So that flattening in 2017 and beyond especially is really a surveillance artifact because we know that these cases are, are, are increasing. We know this from the estimates that we're doing. Uh, we're redoing those Lyme disease burden estimates right now and ICD-10 codes and things like that. And so we know that the numbers of cases have, have increased precipitously just in the last few years. But uh, the curve, the official reporting curves are flattening though. Uh, so they don't really show that so much. Um, what we also see that's interesting, though, is that the geographic distribution is expanding at the same time. And so this really is just two snapshots, one from 2001 and one from 2017. And you can see how uh, where these cases are reported is increasing, you know, hugely. And, um, and it's increasing, uh, moving northward uh, through uh, Minnesota and Wisconsin. It's uh, has expanded uh, westward from the coast all the way across the states of uh, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, uh, New York, uh, up and out through New York, and then up the uh, Hudson River Valley, and then up the uh, eastern seaboard into Maine, um, Vermont, New Hampshire. Again, you kind of see the surveillance artifact in Massachusetts. Um, and uh, if we looked at some of the maps between, uh, you could see, uh, and we've got all these, you can see how it's changed over the years. But, um, but that's sort of what we're seeing, not, not uh, only we're we seeing more cases, but we're seeing more people at risk uh, due to the geographic expansion. And I'll talk a little bit later about the factors that are driving, that we believe are, are uh, driving or, uh, or 
de determining the way this expansion is occurring. But, um, but I do want to mention that it's not just disease cases, but it's also the expansion of the tick. And, um, and so you can see two snapshots here from a paper published in 1996 by David Dennis et al. and a paper published in 2015 by um, Becky Eisen et al. And um, the red is, is where Exodi scapularis is now um, established and the blue is where it had just been uh, reported. And so you can see that we've gone from blue to red and uh, you can see that there's increasing uh, red space on the map. And you can see that there's a lot more red even moving southward. And you can see that um, on the uh, previous slide as well, that we've had Lyme disease cases spreading down uh, into North Carolina and uh, West Virginia and places like that. And uh, that coincides with the uh, uh, increased distribution of the tick, especially uh, um, the um, um, behavior of the, nor the northern clade of Exodi scapularis, which are a lot more avid biters of humans than the southern clade, which tend to be a little bit more uh, zoonotic. They quest down in the leaf litter. They're less likely to bite people. But, um, but you, you can see how the um, numbers of counties where ice gaps and I pacificus uh, are now found has gone from, um, is now seen in 49% of the counties in the U.S. So this is a 45% increase in the numbers of positive counties. So um, just to look at the whole country, not just the uh, eastern half of the country, and then to look at what we're seeing in 2020, and the source of this data is our National Tick Surveillance Program now that's, that uh, we use the ArbonNet portal for reporting of this data from the state health departments. Uh, you can see in this map really where we see Iscapularis reported and established and where we see Exodia specific Pacificus uh, reported and established. So, um, so there's an expansion of range. And I'm going to talk about the drivers for that in just a minute, but I also want to talk about the expansion of high incident counties, which is what you see in this map. And this is from a paper in emerging infectious diseases a few years ago, but it really just shows from 1993 to 2012. So this is over, you know, roughly a 20 year period of time that we saw what we consider high incident counties for Lyme disease uh, increasing by over 320% in the Northeast and, and by around 250% uh, in the North Central portion of the US. And the really dark areas are where uh, the high incident counties in 93 to 97, and then the lighter, increasingly lighter areas are where it has become high incident since, high incidence since that time. Uh, so I think the last thing I'll say about trends really is not only are we seeing a geographic and um, increase and uh, an increase in numbers of cases as well, but we're also seeing an increase in the number of tick-borne pathogens that are out there. And um, if you look back into the 60s, you know, we had about one new tick-borne disease occurring per decade, maybe up, you know, through 2000. And then all of a sudden we saw this explosion of uh, new tick-borne pathogens. So, um, you know, we've seen, um, you know, I already mentioned um, heartland virus and bourbon virus. And bourbon virus is, uh, is, is a putative tick-borne pathogen. We, you know, we, we're not quite ready to call that one on, you know, so-called Koch's postulates for vector-borne diseases that all those uh, criteria have been met. But, you know, for all intents and purposes, we, you know, we consider it a tick-borne pathogen. Uh, but but um, what you see here is that we've seen this, you know, huge expansion in new pathogens. And many of these, or the ones that are, are um, um, marked by blue really are associated with amblyoma americanum. And so we've seen a huge expansion in amblyoma americanum. And then the green are Exodi scapularis. And we've seen a huge expansion in Exodi scapularis over the last several, last two decades. And um, so part of this probably is related to the fact that more people are being exposed to the bites of more ticks. And so you've got more opportunities uh, if you look at it that way, <laughs> for people to get a disease. 
And um, so we're seeing more diseases that have probably been out there for a long time. And this is, then is also aided um, by the fact that we've got better diagnostic tests you now, better ways of detecting novel pathogens, you know, the um, genomics, metagenomics work that people are doing. And so this, this all sort of works together, uh, more sensitive methods of, of detecting pathogens, more people being exposed to tick-borne uh, the bites of infected ticks, more ticks <laughs> to uh, pick these pathogens up from a reservoir host they're feeding on. So uh, all of that is part of the uh, trends that we're seeing. So finally, what are the factors that are kind of driving all of this? Well, I, I think, you know, if you look at the figure in the middle uh, to the right, it's really from New England before the trees were turned. And uh, it really just emphasizes that, you know, in the 1700s, um, that, that much of the land was tilled and, uh, and, and used for agricultural purposes. And yet over the last 200 years, we've seen, um, you know, a, a reforestation occur. Uh, we've seen, uh, with reforestation, we've seen uh, deer populations coming back. Uh, so we have overabundant deer and that, that little graph that you see in the lower um, uh, corner is from uh, Kirby Stafford, at the Connecticut Agriculture Experiment Station, really just showing a deer uh, population census data over uh, the last 100 years. You see how deer populations have, have increased logarithmically. And, um, and then you see in the, the, the uh, color picture in the right, uh, upper right, just how suburbs are built right into wooded areas. And so now you have abundant habitat around homes uh, where uh, num uh, ticks and the uh, rodents that carry Lyme disease are there, and there are other ecological factors, uh, things we call habitat free uh, fragmentation, and ways that the uh, uh, land use patterns have changed. And all of these things translate into increased numbers of ticks and, and increased exposure opportunity uh, to people to the bites of infected ticks. You know, I also mentioned that uh, a changing climate uh, clearly is driving the distribution of ticks uh, further north into areas where we didn't see them in past years. And that's kind of what we see in the next couple of slides. Uh, this is a slide from a colleague of ours, um, the Public Health Agency of Canada, Nick Ogden. It's really just showing some modeling of the uh, distribution of Ixodes scapularis and how the range uh, is, has uh, drifted north. And that's, uh, of course, supported in our surveillance data that we have from the United States, where we've seen that both the tick and disease cases moving uh, in the northward areas um, in the Great Lakes and in Maine and Vermont and those other areas I already pointed out. But uh, basically, uh, temperature, uh, minimal temperature, sort of defines the, for the uh, geographic northward distribution where these ticks can live. They can, because you know these ticks have two to three year life cycles. Most of that time, they're off the host. When they're off the host, they're exposed to harsh environments and uh, can have a big Im uh, impact both on survival and also on reproductive potential. And so um, those things are uh, meaning that we're seeing more ticks and we're seeing ticks spread uh, further north in these areas. But, you know, we're also seeing an impact on, um, on the uh, seasonal onset of Lyme disease. And uh, this was a paper that some colleagues of mine published a few years ago. And it was really just uh, looking at, um, at how, um, I'm sorry, this, I, I skipped over a paper that some colleagues published a few years ago looking at how Lyme disease onset has moved earlier in the year. And so in the aftermath, and that was a surveillance paper, in the, and, and it was linked uh, primarily to cumulative growing degree days. So what we did after that is we, we did this study looking really at, um, if you start at the far left, we looked at uh, the baseline of 1992 to 2007, and we uh, looked at the uh, date of onset, the week of onset for uh, diagnosed Lyme disease cases during that period of time. Then what we did, we, we looked at, th at four different emission scenarios. So these are climate change, different emission scenarios that have been developed that you see along the bottom, RCP 2.6, 4.5, 6.0, and 8.5. And, and, um, and then under those, addition, uh, those different emission scenarios, we looked at an ensemble uh, 
of downscaled uh, models, weather models, uh, to um, look at how the, the season of risk might change, kind of based on uh, what we call cumulative growing degree days. So, so the, the simple way of thinking about that, if you start, you know, in the beginning of the year and you look at how much heat, you know, accumulates over the year, over the year, uh, and you look at that in terms of the met metabolism of the tick off the host, uh, as that that temperature increases, that tick is going to develop faster. And that means it's going to come out earlier in the spring. And so when those questing nymphs emerge in the spring really determines uh, when the season of risk is going to start. And so basically to summarize this thing really simply, what we see is the season of risk using these different models uh, is moving earlier in the year. And that actually fits uh, the surveillance data that we saw retrospectively looking back over Lyme disease over the last 30 years and uh, looking at how the cases have moved earlier in the year. So we can look at surveillance data. Now we can model it going forward. And so the bottom line on this is ticks will be coming out early in the year. So not only are they spreading further northward, uh, having more people at risk, now we also anticipate having longer transmission seasons, longer times in which people could be bitten by infected ticks. So all this really just says that the trends we've seen in these tick-borne diseases that are, we're seeing more cases every year, further geographic distribution, there's no reason to think this isn't gonna get worse. And sorry to paint kind of a doomsday picture on that, but for all of us working in public health entomology with ticks, you'll probably have a job uh, go, going forward and a lot of job security. So I'll say that to any students who are out there interested in this field. So just to summarize all of that, minimum temperatures primarily define the northern distribution of the ticks. Warmer temperatures increase uh, the reproductive capacities. This leads to larger populations, uh, greater risk for disease transmission. Um, one thing I didn't mention is that higher moisture levels allow tick survival in warmer environments. So we don't necessarily think ticks are gonna disappear from the south just because it's getting warmer there because they know how to find uh, warm, humid places and they'll be able to sub survive okay in those microclimates. Uh, temperature and moisture affects tick behavior. They come out in quest. Uh, and, um, and then uh, temperature, cumulative growing degree days affects the seasonality. So just to call one last, uh, call your attention to one last publication, if you missed this one, and it was a report from the U.S. Global Change Research Program a few years ago, really the impacts of climate change on human health in the United States. And uh, if you look at the key findings, three of the four uh, key findings really um, have a significant impact on um, on, uh, on predict the significant impact on uh, tick-borne diseases. I'm, I'm noticing I put one of my red arrows in the wrong place. This red arrow really ought to be up here under the, the, the second key finding. But that aside, uh, all of the key findings are here. And it's really just that climate change, uh, you know, is expected to alter the geographic and seasonal distribution of ex existing vectors and vector-borne diseases. And uh, the tick activity and northward range expansion, we expect to see that to continue. And then we expect to see new vector-borne pathogens occur. Uh, because of just all of this mix, not simply of exotic vectors like Haemophysalis long, uh, longicornis, the longhorn tick, but also uh, more ticks um, out there, more chances for people to be exposed to disease agents that once were rare, but now they're going to be more common. So, um, so all of that, I'll finish up just by saying a little bit about prevention. Um, you know, currently, as you, as, as you all probably know, there's, there are no vaccines that are available in the U.S. for preventing any of the tick-borne uh, diseases that we have here. So uh, there, of course, is a Lyme disease vaccine that's um, going through phase two clinical trials right now, and, and the results are looking really good on that. That's very promising. But until those vaccines are out there, and, uh, and of course, the Lyme disease vaccine is just a Lyme disease vaccine. It's not protective or wouldn't, wouldn't assume to be protective against those other tick-borne pathogens. But um, until then, prevention efforts really focus 
um, really exclusively on reducing exposure uh, to ticks on persons, pets, and property is sort of what we focus on at CDC. And so this means uh, wearing repellents, uh, doing tick checks after you've been out in the field, showering um, to wash away any um, unattached ticks, and, um, and then doing, um, you know, reporting quickly to your physician or healthcare provider if you're bitten by a tick or you have a illness, a fever uh, in the summer, summertime, you've been outdoors. And uh, early and accurate diagnosis and treatment is really hugely important for all of these tick-borne diseases. Uh, some of them can be fatal, other can, others can be just highly debilitating. And, um, but the sooner you are diagnosed and sooner you're treated, the better the outcome. So it's very important to uh, take part in these primary and secondary prevention uh, um, activities that we have here. Uh, this page just shows some of our tools and resources at CDC that you can utilize. And um, we have um, um, pamphlets and trail signs and all kinds of things you can either download or you can call and we can send them to you. And so really just summarizing and concluding, um, tick-borne diseases are very important. Um, public health concern, uh, tick-borne diseases are increasing in the U.S., both in incidence and in distribution, and in also in the number of new pathogens that we're seeing. Uh, the drivers for tick-borne disease emergence are really related to increasing exposure to the bites of infected ticks, largely from increasing deer populations and other changes in the natural and built environments. And then finally, in the absence of vaccines in the U.S., primary prevention focuses on reducing exposure to ticks and quickly removing ticks on people or clothing. And I admitted to say that you can also, in terms of preventing ticks, if you've been out hiking and you come back in, you know, do a tick check and throw your clothes in the dryer on high heat. You can do that for 10 minutes and uh, you know, your, your socks, you should spray your, your boots down or shoes down with permethrin and you should um, throw your clothes in the dryer on high heat and that'll kill the ticks on them. And that's, uh, that, that's something else you should make sure that you do. Uh, during tick season. And uh, I'll just close by saying, often we're asked, uh, is it going to be a bad year for ticks? And the uh, bottom line on that is that if you live in the area where all these tick-borne diseases are endemic, every year is a bad year. There's no such thing as good years and bad years. Some years may be worse than others, but every year is a bad year if you live in those areas. So you can't let your guard down. And you just need to be aware of that and to um, take proper precautions. So I'll stop with that and can take questions or engage in discussion. Great, thanks. That, that, that last point, I think uh, I often say that what people make the mistake of doing is, you know, here in the Northeast, it's, it's a relatively slow time for tick season, the end of July going into August. And so many people interpret that this has been a good tick year because there aren't many ticks in August because they're comparing August of 2020 to May of 2020. Um, when in point of fact, if they looked at August 2020 and looked back at uh, August 2019, they'd find it's about the same number of ticks that locally they'd see. But yeah, it's a, it's a common misconception I think people are, are led into. You outline this ecological and climate narrative that's, that tells how we think uh, the expansion of ticks and tick-borne diseases, Lyme disease in particular, has occurred. Doesn't seem like that narrative leaves much room for a um, a release of a of a bio tech bioterrorism weapon or a biological warfare weapon. Yeah. So you know, there's been a lot of talk about that uh, lately, and um, you know, I, I think for me, um, the model that I see with Lyme disease really is if you think about Lyme disease has been here in my opinion for many, many, many years. And um, that it probably possibly came over, you know, with European settlers, um, you know, maybe or maybe not, but we, we have Lyme disease um, in the Eastern US, in the upper Midwest and on the West Coast. And um, those uh, Lyme disease pathogens, um, you know, have been emerging uh, primarily in the, in, the, in the Northeast and the upper Midwest. And so, as I'm sure you know, Lyme disease was originally uh, discovered in, um, you know, in the 70s and, and it was uh, seen in the late 70s and it was seen in coastal Connecticut 
and um, in Old Lyme, Connecticut. But, you know, there was a, a paper published from the same uh, time era uh, from, uh, from uh, Wisconsin, and it was from a hunter there who had a tick bite, classic erythema migrans, rash, uh, fever, and, um, and was treated with, with uh, tetracycline and recovered. And um, so and we, we know that Lyme disease has been there as long as it's been in the Northeast, as far as we can tell. Mm -hmm. And so what I, I think of is Lyme disease as being more re-emerging than just simply emerging, and that quite likely it was here. And then as, um, you know, settlers uh, uh, planted uh, the crops and we got rid of habitat where deer were and the deer populations went really down. Lyme disease sort of shrunk back to <clears throat> some little islands, you know, uh, where it was maintained. And then, uh, and then with the changing reforestation and expanding deer populations, we've seen it reemerge across these habitats where it probably could have been before. But I think of it more that way Clearly, Lyme disease has been found in museum specimens going back to the 40s, and, and a lot of, uh, of this sort of, uh, these, these findings really sort of suggest to me that more of a model, an ecological model, than a bioterrorism experiment gone awry. And um, yeah, so I'll, I'll just leave it with that. Well, thanks so much. This has been a great pleasure to have you on. And I know people look to CDC as authority on this. And so it's great to hear your voice and uh, have these insights. So thank you for your time. Well, thanks, Stephen and Paul. And, and Stephen, I just also want to give a shout out to you and all the great work that you and the rest of, uh, there, there's a great critical mass of uh, Lyme disease experts there in Massachusetts, tick experts, uh, our colleagues at the state health department. And uh, there's really some great uh, vector-borne disease work that's going on there. And I appreciate your efforts in doing this webinar. So thank you for that. Thanks.